This is Adeline Siu, Editor of Pharmaceutical Technology Europe. Joining me today is Joe Galati, Manager of Toxicology Services, Marvin Faber, Senior Director and Global Head of Environmental Health and Safety, and Jeff Dinya, Director of Environmental Health and Safety North America and Global Potent Compound Expert, all from Payton. Joe, Marvin, and Jeff, thank you for being here to talk with us about the manufacture of highly potent APIs. Firstly, how do you define a drug as highly potent? In the pharmaceutical industry, there are an increasing number of novel and potent drug candidates that have highlighted the need for a system to ensure their safe manufacturing. At Patheon and at many pharmaceutical companies, it is the responsibility of an occupational toxicologist to determine whether a drug, in particular the active pharmaceutical ingredient or the active component of the drug, uh, whether that would be considered potent or not. The use of control banding, which is a procedure for assigning a chemical, such as an API, to a hazard category, is a useful tool to promote occupational health and safety and to determine whether a drug would be considered highly potent. Control bands, with their corresponding containment requirements, are intended to minimize worker exposures. The corresponding slide shows Patheon's categorization banding system, which includes four bands with their occupational exposure limit ranges. An OEL is a safe airborne limit. It is the amount of a, of a compound that an employee can be exposed to eight hours per day, five days per week for their entire working lives without any adverse effects occurring. Essentially, the OEL cutoff for a potent versus a non-potent drug would be 10 microgram per meter cubed, and the cutoff for the therapeutic dose or pharmacological potency is 10 milligram per day. When determining whether a drug is highly potent, the toxicity profile of the drug is extensively reviewed, including data for acute toxicity, systemic toxicity, genotoxicity, carcinogenicity, developmental toxicity, and all other toxic endpoints. Non-potent drugs are typically very well studied and have reversible effects that can occur at moderate to high doses. In defining whether a drug is potent or highly potent, these compounds cause serious toxic effects at low doses and include sensitizers, teratogens, carcinogens, and drugs with irreversible health effects. Can you talk us through the various challenges involved in the production and handling of highly potent drugs, for example, the facility design, engineering controls, containment procedures, waste management, etc.? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I think the main place to start is the classification of the compound. As Joe mentioned, you really need to know the toxicity profile. But another element to that is understanding if it is in a particular kind of class, for example, a hormone, a beta-lactam antibiotic, or a cytotoxic. These may all trigger kind of regulatory implications that you have to be sure your, your facility can handle. For example, if it's cytotoxic under GMP regulations, um, designated facilities are, are required. So you have to be sure your, your facility footprint can handle that, and it's also in line with your site licenses. And there's also a number of design considerations. You want to be looking at, especially particularly for high potency, you want a single pass air approach. So in other words, you don't want air recirculating from a high potency suite to an area that's low potency. You would also want to have separate gowning in and gowning out procedures. So for example, an employee would enter through a particular entrance and gown into their appropriate PPE, enter the suite, conduct their activities, and then when they leave that suite, they would exit out a different exit through a misting shower and then a formal gown out procedure. So you really want to be looking at sort of a one-way personnel um, approach. So, And that would also go with material flow. You would want a similar type approach. You really want to set up your facilities to be negative pressure suites. So you don't want air from your production suite exiting and leaving into the corridor. You want your air from the corridor coming in to the production suites because once the air is out in, once the contaminated powder or high potency powder is out in the corridors, you have a greater risk of cross-contamination. You want to look at containing at the source. So we're talking about isolators, closed transfer systems, things like this. A challenge can, is really the expense here. There can be a lot of capital costs associated with it, but you really want to be looking at basically no open product handling. So you really want to avoid hand scooping and things like that. You can use a risk-based approach for industrial hygiene air monitoring to really uh, confirm that the approach is effective. So you want to be targeting 50% of the occupational exposure limit to ensure that this is being achieved. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in uh, uh, maybe a bit later on. Um, regarding pharmaceutical waste, 
they really should be incinerated. That's a practice that we do here, and it's also a requirement from our clients, where they would ask for certificates of destruction to verify that things have been uh, destroyed. How would you describe the systematic approach for technical transfer and commercial manufacturing of highly potent drugs? At PCON, we use a systematic approach to to assess materials when they come in. And for us, really, in simple forms, is that we want to look at a new product coming in or a new active ingredient coming in and compare it to our existing processes and existing already established uh, safe safe procedures and ensure that the two uh, work together and that, and that uh, there's no modifications that are required. And so the corresponding slide depicts our, our approach to it. And the first uh, three items, product evaluation, quotation, categorization, this is essentially establishing what the toxicological properties are of the material, of the active ingredient, and it allows us to measure apples to apples, essentially, so that we can compare to existing products that we have and existing systems we have in place. So that to us, this is the, very, the first step and in, in a critical step in, in further assessing uh, how we can safely manufacture the material. The next step really uh, looks at the individual processes and the specific details of each product, each product, and each active pharmaceutical ingredient. Uh, and so we look at the excipients, we look at the active ingredient in the environment health and safety assessment. Uh, we consider are the materials combustible? If so, how sensitive are those materials? Are there other hazards associated with the materials? Are we using flammable compounds? And that's all done as part of this assessment. Um, does the material trigger uh, other regulatory issues? Are there air emissions, water emissions, environmental reporting? Uh, then we evaluate the process. Uh, does it involve new equipment? Do we need to have operators interact with equipment differently? You know, in some cases, a product may be light sensitive and we have people working under different lighting conditions. And so all of that needs to be assessed. From there, it drives into our engineering solutions. What engineering solutions are required to achieve the containment or to, to control the flammable liquids that may be generated, uh, vapors that may be generated if we're using flammable liquids. From there, we go to a, a process review. And, and for me, this is not the end. This is a continuous improvement. As we know, processes evolve. You know, habits form with employees that are working with the product. Filings can change over time. Technology can change. So we can detect at a, a even a lower level or there's new equipment on the market that will allow us to contain better. And so we, it's a matter of continuous improvement. So we always go back and review our process, not just at the end of a project, but, but throughout the life course of a, of a product and continue to make improvements, which can trigger further valuation and categorization as we get more data, more toxicology studies are completed, and then we do an assessment to see if any changes need to be made see if engineering solutions need to be modified, and then back to process review. So it's an ongoing, evolving process. Thank you for your insights. This is Adeline Siu, Editor of Pharmaceutical Technology Europe.